So, so Bill Pomeroy, I'm a veterinarian. I, I left practice after oh, quite a long time ago now, and I've been teaching uh, under, undergraduate vet students about parasites uh, since then, as Angela pointed out. And what I want to talk about today is the results of a survey that some of you may have taken, well, it was certainly sent out to all sheep and beef farmers uh, a couple of years ago, and just to present some of the results and also provide a bit of background information about uh, flies and, and, and lice on sheep. So this particular survey went out with countrywide, the, the sheep edition, so it goes to all registered uh, sheep farmers in the country. So there's 14,000 questionnaires went out. It comprised uh, 30 questions, both open and closed. So open, you actually had to write an answer, uh, such as which insecticide did you use? Um, and closed questions, which is a multiple choice type question where you actually tick one of two or three or four or five boxes. Uh, and invariably with these sort of questionnaires, the first chunk of them are actually about who you are and where you live, because uh, that actually helps to, to, to provide some information about uh, the following ones. And then sixth thing, we're on fly strike and lice, and then if you recall the questionnaire, there were a few tail end ones about uh, tail end castration, and I'm not going to refer to those today. And it was undertaken as a contract to New Zealand Marina uh, through their Wool Unleashed PGP program. And as Angela mentioned, we're just launching into a, a follow-on project which will involve a PhD student to try and develop a risk analysis model that we could put out there in real time to actually try and assess fly strike risk, particularly to try and tag the beginning and the end of the fly strike season. And if we apply that to these um, virtual climate stations, which the country is now divided into a five kilometre grid pattern, we should be able to actually provide that as a, uh, as, as a real-time thing to actually make it relevant to the whole country, we hope. That's the plan. So of that 14,000, we got 1,253 back. That's actually a pretty good return rate, actually, for this sort of questionnaire. Uh, the interesting thing was, that, so there was an option to actually use the reply paid envelope, uh, which went out with the questionnaire, or to go online and actually answer the questionnaire online. You'll see from, from the screen there that Fewer than 20 farms answered online, and the rest of them used the reply paid envelope. So uh, uh, I know a similar questionnaire was, was uh, in the area was, was actually also circulating um, from, a, from another group, which was only online, and they got a, a very feeble response, 40 or 50 responses. So online surveys, at this stage anyway, aren't that successful. So just a couple of demographic type pictures, just to sort of show the sort of the range of, of farmers that responded. So this is the, the size in terms of numbers of, of sheep, and you can see we're going right across the spectrum of sheep farms in New Zealand in terms of responses. We're not overly sort of concentrating on, on small lifestyle type enterprises. It's, it's right across the board, which is nice. Uh, <coughs> and we could actually split it down to actually type of sheep, but the data I'm going to present today is actually going to not go to that level. You have to be a little careful with these sorts of things, how far you dig and then how relevant the actual answers are. It gets a little bit messy when you go too far down. And just to demonstrate, we've actually got a pretty fair representation from around the country. And we even got six, six, um, six responses down here from the West Coast and uh, even one from Nelson. And uh, I know in the Nelson area, according to the survey data I've seen, there's not a lot of sheep. So just to back off a little and talk about fly strike uh, for a few slides, just to sort of recap to actually sort of put some relevance to it. So with fly strike, we talk about having primary strike flies who can initiate a strike. And then we talk about secondary strikes or even tertiary strikes, depending on what jargon you want to use, which are flies that can come along and make use of an existing wound and then um, successfully sort of infest that. And of the primary strike flies, we recognise three. And so this slide is just representing the two of those, Lucilia caprina and Lucilia sericata. And they're both these uh, coppery green flies. I suspect you've all seen them um, to your angst. And the difference between the two of them is actually very little. It relates to the placement of a few bristles around the head and the colour of this first joint on the first pair of, uh, first pair of legs. So the upshot is you're not going to be able to separate Caprina from Sericata. It's 
going to become more and more relevant as time goes on which, which one's which because we are going to start to see insecticide resistance becoming more of an issue. doesn't seem to be too much of an issue at the moment, but if we look across the Tasman to Australia, it, it is an issue for them over there. Interestingly in Australia, and I've got a slide on uh, to to Brian, I'll get to it in a moment. But um, <coughs> whoops. But Caprino uh, is the only one that they're focused on in Australia, whereas here we actually focus on all three of these primary strike species. And with the PhD project, we'll, we'll get more information to actually try and uh, see which one's more relevant for us. So we're talking about mean temperatures, and it's temperature driven, and most people appreciate that. So Lucilia Caprina is interesting because it's changed the picture of fly strike over the last few years. It's been here long enough now that most people have probably forgotten what things were like before it arrived. Um, Sericata, the other Lucilia species, Lucilia sericata arrived here when sheep arrived here. So it's been here forever. It's the fly strike species which uh, causes fly strike in the UK. And if you see those um, CSI type programs where someone goes out and takes maggots off a cadaver, a dead person, to see how long they've been dead, they're commonly looking for sericata. Because sericata breeds quite happily in, in carrion, dead, dead animal things. Uh, <coughs> Caprina is a species that was actually originally tropical, and it was quite common in the tropics, and it also bred on carrion. And if you look up the books, that's where it is. It's spread right around the world in the tropical regions. But over in South Africa, um, 150, 200 years ago, it seemed to adapt itself to, to, to sheep. And when sheep were imported into Australia from South Africa, they brought Caprina with them. But they never, for whatever reason, didn't survive the boat ride to New Zealand at, at that time. And so we didn't have it. It was first picked up in 88. And then by backtracking, it was figured out that it came across in the early 80s. Probably that was the time of the live sheep trade. Probably sheep ships picking up a half load in Australia, crossing the Tasman, picking up another half load, that's three or four or five days later, that's long enough for maggots to develop, drop off, pupate, and then get up and fly away, and then fly off to New Zealand. And the interesting thing is there that the, the, the Cilia caprina was observed to be already resistant, and the, I've got it up there already, OP resistant, that's organophosphate insecticide resistant. Uh, so the ones we've got here doesn't really worry us too much anymore because OPs have largely disappeared from our potential armoury. And then it's gradually moved down the South Island, and that makes an interesting story in and of itself because it's changed, as I sort of hinted at, the actual distribution. There hasn't been a lot of work done on fly strike in New Zealand. Uh, <coughs> so I'm sort of going to try and just recap some of the, the key bits for you. And th this is some work that was done by Dallas Bishop and Alan Heath of Ag Research. And they were actually getting school students and farmers to submit maggots over several years uh, and they actually tracked the actual movement of caprina and you can see there that in the early 80s they weren't too sure and in the South Island uh, in the early 80s there was no sign of caprina but over the course of those next five or six years it became reasonably common in the South Island so it had moved south and the interesting thing is it's actually moved further south than Sericata actually um, preferred to, to, to inhabit which is interesting because originally it started as a tropical species so you wouldn't have thought it would go that far south but it's actually extended the range of fly strike further south. Uh, it's more common in the north according to this, these numbers. Uh, we have no other numbers really to compare to be honest. Um, whether that's still the case, hopefully another thing for the PhD student to sort of figure out. So that's, that's the Lucilia story for the moment. The other third primary strike fly is uh, Calliphrostigia. This is the big brown blowfly that there's a few species that look very similar, but commonly you'll see this one just buzzing around your house. This is the big brown blowfly that gets in there and just buzzes slowly. And you'll even occasionally see it over winter. A tatty specimen will be hiding there in, the, in the, uh, the dark and on a warm winter's day it'll come out and fly around the house very slowly and then disappear again. Although they mainly overwinter as pupae in the soil. But the thing about Stygia is it's, it's much less seasonal. So early season strikes, more likely to be stygia. Um, and also later season strike. So extends the season somewhat. And then the secondary strike flies really aren't a big deal for us. Um, <coughs> there's another similar coppery green fly, looks quite like the cilia. 
It's actually Christ on my roof of faces. Um, and you'll see from the picture up there, not the greatest picture in the world, but it's got these black bands on these abdominal segments. So it is subtly different, whereas Lucilia tends to be quite an even uh, coppery green right down across the abdomen. Uh, <coughs> but the interesting thing about this one is, and this gets a few people excited from time to time, is that the maggots of Chrysomyia tend to have these large, rather large, well, rather than bristles, and, and Lucilia has very f fine CT. Uh, these ones are big cuticular extensions, and it, so it's called the hairy maggot blowfly. And so if you see those in a wound, people get a little bit excited from time to time, but in fact that's, that's relatively normal. Well, it is normal. And back to sort of that Heath and Bishop data, from that uh, fly tracker survey with the school kids and the farmers in the 90s. And these are the sort of numbers they got. And you'll see the way that Caprina is now dominating the picture. So, 10 years or so after it first arrived, it's now the dominant fly strike species. But Sericata and Stygia are still around. And then Chrysomyia, the secondary strike species, fairly insignificant actually. This is across the country, and they did get it. Uh, but, but you'll see that the data is a bit inconsistent. Uh, and they admit that. Um, North Island more common than the South, but this is implying that even in the South Island there's more Caprina than there are Sericata. So Caprina has become our, our important, um, well, an important species, the most important species arguably. Now just remember how fly strike works. So the eggs are laid, and all those three species generally lay eggs, although Stygia will on a really warm period of time actually lay live maggots. But uh, generally, they all lay eggs, and they like dark, moist areas, and they'll spend a lot of time actually moving around trying to find those. And then day two, three, four, five, they're actually on the animal, going through these th those maggot instars, and they drop off. If we get weather conditions over this period that aren't conducive for flies to fly, that first strike happens, maggots drop off, the wound heals. Uh, <clears throat> so if you're seeing different ages of, of maggots actually on an animal, then you're talking about strikes and restrikes, and that's that's a fairly common. That's that's more common than not. But we do get situations where the weather conditions mean the flies aren't around. A strike happens, and the first thing you know about it is when the shearers actually see that shearing. And the pupae are in the soil for a period of time, but the biological capability, the, the, the reproductive capability here is actually quite high because you're getting a lot of maggots, um, a lot of eggs being laid, a lot of maggots, and the whole the whole cycle is actually quite short. This is showing day 15, but it's actually temperature dependent. It can even be shorter than that. So short-term weather conditions can be quite important. So rapid, <coughs> rapid increase in numbers. Uh, a couple hundred eggs per day. They get away over winter as those pupae somewhere in the soil. And the short-term weather conditions are critical. And they can actually, uh, they can follow olfactory cues and they can follow olfactory cues olfactory cues supposedly for uh, even a few kilometres. Um, so what you do on your farm can be influenced by what the farmer uh, a couple of kilometres away has actually done previously. Now this particular one here I just put up because this is what uh, <coughs> Ethan Bishop actually came up with and this is what we want to try and replicate in a model but make it real time and live and you can see the difference between this is so that's August, September, this is when the beginning of the fly strike season, the stig is earlier and, and uh, Caprina is actually earlier than Sericata, which is surprising. But they see the difference between the North Island and the South Island. And, and, and according to this, the South Island season for Caprina is quite short, but that's inconsistent with the, the number of maggots that were actually submitted. So we'll see whether that's still true or not. <clears throat> and flies like honeydew and they will generally breed on carrion quite happily, but except for Caprina. So the thing about Caprina when it came out of South Africa is it adapts itself to sheep and it will only really survive on live sheep. It doesn't compete on carrion. So if there's Sericata, Stygia and other blowflies around, Caprina won't survive. So dead, picking up all the dead sheep probably won't influence Caprina very much. So if you can control Caprina on the sheep, then at least that's one of the three largely under control. And that's what the Australians will focus on because they're only really interested in Caprina, whereas we've got Sericata and Stygia and we have to consider both of them. So some of the advice you see for Australia doesn't necessarily apply here. I'll get back to the survey in a sec. But just to sort of, just to sort of take that story a little further, 
So what actually happens? The thing about a primary strike fly is that it can initiate strike on intact skin. But it takes, so the, the, la the maggots go through three stages called instars. And the first instar is the one that abrades the skin and actually makes the wound. So it's got to have a nutrient source to actually allow it to get through that phase. And so that's the thing about primary strike flies. They can live on some high protein type material that's in and around the fleece. And wet skin with a bit of a dermatitis provides that, dermatophilus, uh, sort of rain school, pseudomonas does it. So those sort of um, risk factors will actually allow fly strike to happen. And then the, the wound expands rapidly and the actual disease actually follows on from protein fluid electrolyte. It's like a big nasty burn. That's, that's the end game and so the, that's how the body is responding and those toxins that get absorbed is what actually kills the animal. <clears throat> right, back to the survey. I'm going to kill that light before I'm finished. Uh, <clears throat> so, this is the survey and, and, and an opinion of, of farmers. So the, the key one, how important do you actually rate fly strike? Uh, so it's a closed question. And if you lump very important and important together, this is right across the country, you'll see that well over 80% of farmers put it actually up in that category. If I compare that with the, with a previous survey, much smaller, which was associated with a worm anthelmintic drench resistance survey back in the mid 2000s that we undertook. And this was asking the 72 participants there which diseases they considered the most important to them. And it was an interesting way to do it, but what you're looking for are the bigger numbers. Not surprisingly, worms come out number one, down here at 46. Fly strike comes in two, number 22. And there's a 12 there somewhere, where did it go? So lice are down here at nine. We've actually got abortion at 10, drench resistance, which is worms again, at 10. And then uh, lice are coming down here at nine. So worms number one, uh, fly strike number two, and lice aren't far, be far behind. It's interesting how some of the other diseases, pleurisy, pneumonia, prolapse, Brandenburg, Yoni's disease, are really almost on a different scale on, on the axis in terms of what farmers' opinions are. So we didn't ask that comparative question in this particular survey, but our results are consistent with that survey. And if you look at what happens as we go down the country, so I haven't split this up by sheep type, but I have split it up by area. So on the North Island, if you look at the very important, the blue wedge there, uh, and you actually track it as we go down, so top of the south, bottom of the south, the south and the and Otago, um, you can see that that blue wedge is getting smaller. But even at the bottom of the south, if you put in very important and important together, um, we're at 64%. And very few are considering it unimportant, which is a change. If you'd asked that question before Caprina arrived, at the bottom of the south, I, I suspect that that brown wedge and this grey wedge here would be much bigger. Okay, just switch, switching to lice for a sec. So we've got <clears throat> three species of lice on sheep, and we tend to forget that, um, probably justifiably in, in many respects. But Vicularovus used to be called Damolinia rovus, but the taxonomist came along and decided to change its name. So some of you might remember it as Damolinia, but it's Bovicular is the accepted name these days. That's the body louse, that's the one really when we talk about lice that we're talking about. But we do have a couple of species of sucking lice, which you think about cattle, sucking lice are actually quite common on cattle, uh, but they're not on sheep. These things are, I've got uncommon, but rare is probably a fair thing. So this is Bovicular over here with its wider head. Um, and the other thing to remember is that lice on sheep are very host specific. So cattle lice don't go on sheep and vice versa. In fact, goat lice go on goats and sheep lice go on sheep. So unlike worms, where they'll cross over between goats and sheep, lice don't. And they don't go on humans, uh, they don't go on horses, etc. And don't go on dogs. They're very, they're very host specific. And so people are familiar with the, the, the pictures of, of lousy sheep and rubbing themselves and the pruritus associated with it. <clears throat> but if we go back to Bovicular ovus, the biting louse, the one we're mainly interested in, or almost predominantly interested in, we call it a biting louse, and that confuses some people because I think biting, it's biting into the animal. It actually feeds on surface debris. If it, if it eats any cells, it eats the dead cells. 
So yes, there's contact in terms of the immune response because some of those materials that, that the louse excretes get absorbed through the skin, but it's not like a sucking animal where it's actually having a direct interaction with the bloodstream or the lymphatics. The other, in, the other difference that's worth just remembering, and you'll see that come up in a sec, is that numbers actually expand over winter and they increase over the summer as a general rule. Although on young animals, you, you, tend to, you do tend to get a, a surge in, in louse numbers uh, in November, December. So it's not quite as simple as a temperature effect. They don't like, they don't like short wool, so shearing an animal will actually dramatically crash its, its louse burden. Uh, their, bio, their reproductive potential is very slow. The females produce one egg per day. Um, so if you take that out, it's four to five months to go up a hundredfold. Very different to flies. And therefore you need two lice per square centimetre to get a high burden of 200 per square centimetre over winter. Because it's over that winter period that you're actually concerned. If you're concerned about lice, that's what you want to avoid happening. And so the general idea is if you, get, if you keep louse numbers small going into winter, even if you don't eradicate it, if you eradicate lice, that's good. But if you get them low going into winter, then you won't, shouldn't have a problem with, with lice affecting the, 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 the wool over that winter period. And then when you get this warmer period, um, the temperature effects will actually control them to some extent. And the other thing to remember is that adults, lice live about six weeks. And that affects some insecticides because some insecticides don't affect the adults. They just affect the, the, the molting stages. They can only interfere with molting. So the adults have to die of old age some of those insect, insect growth regulator insecticides. What do they do? They cause physical irritation. You know, broken fibres, everyone's seen this. Broken fibres, change of colour, wool gets downgraded. But for a, for a, a, coarser, a wool, uh, um, coarser wool sheep, that has some effect on price, potentially, although we don't really have a good handle on what that is, but probably isn't very great. For fine wool animals, different story. And so I'm just quoting that Australian that Australian data there is seven to twelve dollars per lousy sheep. So they have a big focus on the importance of lice. Whereas for our Romney type coarser wool sheep, uh, the effect in terms of value uh, to the to the wool is probably well will be a whole lot less. And the Australians estimated that you can lose somewhere about half a kilo give or take of wool just due to fibre loss being rubbed off. But the cotting would be the main issue. So interestingly, when you ask how important the lice, they're still considered very important. So here's a New Zealand picture overall. Very important, important, put them together, only up to 77%. But interestingly, as you go down the country from the North Island, top of the North Island, top of the South, bottom of the South, you see the very important wedges getting bigger. Uh, so they're considered more important at the bottom of the New Zealand than they are in the North Island, which is a flip around from fly stroke. And you, you could argue that because people are concerned about fly strike, they're less concerned about lice and vice versa. <clears throat> now the last survey of, of, of fly strike, and I really am going to kill that light. Uh, uh, the last, it's all right. I will try and avoid the angel. <laughs> Thanks. The last survey was this one here back in 1976. And in essence, what you can see is that we're going north to south, and this is more than 1.5%, 09 to 1.4% is, is the thinner crosshatch, and then this is less than half a percent. So essentially, back then, before Caprina arrived, minimal fly strike down south. That's changed. <clears throat> if you actually have a look to see uh, in the next couple of slides, well, we're actually just showing an estimate. Of, we, asked, we asked farmers to actually tick a box whether that no fly strike, less than 2%, 5 to 10%, greater than 10%, and there was a few didn't respond in any way, shape or form. If we take New Zealand as a whole, what we can see, this brown wedge here is no fly strike on the farm, 16%. This is something up to 2%, so it could be very little, uh, all the way up to 2%. 67% and you can see we've actually got, I think when we're getting up here to 10% we're getting into the disaster zone sort of territory really. Now this is in the face of farmers doing what they normally do to control fly strike. This is not leaving sheep untreated and trying to get fly strike. This is normal every day I'm, I'm doing what I should be doing. 
and we're still seeing this level of fly strike. And as you actually move down the country, top North Island, so that the 0% uh, the there is 10%, top of the south 26% and even the bottom of the south are 26%. What surprised me when these numbers came in was this figure down here. Based on that earlier work, I thought that this would be different. I thought there'd be less fly strike reported down the bottom of the South Island, but uh, no. Fewer disasters, but even, the, but even down the bottom of the South, there are some relative disasters being sort of recorded, which is um, 2 to 5 per cent, that yellow wedge. It's lost its line for some reason. <coughs> My argument would be that given that we're actually, that these sheep are actually being uh, looked after, that I think that brown wedge for zero is too small. And, and this grey wedge here for actually getting some fly strike um, is too big. You'd like to think that th in this day and age we could actually get this down to quite a small percentage and even tiny percentages up here and this one should be the dominant one but that's not the story. And this is on, this is ewes and tutus. <clears throat> now the only other data we've got on, on fly strike is this data here, you get too close to that little whistle. And this is actually Sue Cooper at Leather and Shoe Research. Uh, through the 2000s up to 2012, although her U data stopped a bit earlier, used to go to the fell mongeries and actually get their data and actually record what they were, how they were grading and what faults they found on pelts. And so you can see a series of years here and a series of issues, blind rib, I'm still not too sure what blind rib is. Uh, but here's the fly strike numbers and you can see about 1% to higher than that of, of ewe pelts actually had fly strike lesions on them. And the interesting thing is that when you get a fly strike lesion and you actually skin those animals, as I get, I'm presuming probably most of you have seen, you get adhesions. And when the, when the pelting machine rips it off, it's damaging the carcass underneath. So you're, you're, you're running a high risk of these animals. The carcasses on these animals is 1% of animals being devalued because of that adhesion issue. And the pelt certainly isn't worth very much. And so that, that number there is sort of consistent with the, the, the previous slide that I just showed you. So things haven't changed in the 10 years since Sue stopped collecting data. Percentage of lambs that are fly struck, it's remarkably similar graph to the ewes. Um, except the brown wedge is actually even smaller. And so I would argue that that brown wedge should be bigger. Um, the grey ones at least are goodly sized, but that's two thirds of farmers are saying they get some fly strike, but it's still occurring. And we can see there are still disasters occurring. Uh, <clears throat> although fortunately, uh, no more than 10% uh, were actually reported in this particular survey. As you can see, as you move down the country, it doesn't change that much. North, top of the south, bottom of the south, those wedges are remarkably similar sized. <clears throat> hey? That's my 10 minute cue, is it? Okay. <laughs> All right, so when we look at lamb pelts, this is from Sue Cooper's data at Lazarus again. Here's the level of fly strike that she was picking up on lamb pelts, sitting about that 1%. Now, bearing in mind that very few of these fly strike lambs are going to be kept as, as a replacement use, then in fact, um, that 1% that I showed you on the ewes will be different animals from these. That, that'll be fly strike accumulated over their life. The interesting thing from, from um, <coughs> Sue Cooper's data from Lazra is what time of the year those, those fly struck pelts were, were, were being, uh, the animals were being killed. And you can see that here we've got the year, uh, we've got the time of fly strike around summer is here, but very few of those animals make it to slaughter. Those animals actually don't make it to slaughter until much later. So they're dominant at the end of the season, or beginning of the next season really. Um, so that, that's how long they take to actually recover their body condition. So not only have you got adhesion problems, they take a long time to grow. <coughs> Methods used to prevent fly strike. Um, so th this is everything that we had on there, and the ones I've got in green are the actual um, ways to apply insecticides. So automatic jetting races, 37% are dominating. Manual jetting, that includes gorse guns, is 25%. Shower dips are still being used around 9% and plunge dips are pretty much gone. But 
uh, the shower dip story has uh, changed quite a lot. If you go back to that 1976 survey, I've got current surveys, the one I'm talking about today, in green, and the one from 76 is up here in black. And so we've gone to 69 to 25 for jetting guns converted gorse guns, and we didn't try to differentiate. Shower dips went from 37 down to 9. Plunge dips were still being used then, but they've effectively disappeared and then 5% were doing something else in that particular survey. Insecticide treatments, they dominate, they dominate over the summer period and this is treatments for fly, insecticide treatments for fly and for lice at the bottom and you can see they tend to coincide despite the fact that lice are a problem in winter. And that relates to the fact that many insecticide treatments are actually used for fly and lice to try and get both at the same time and many louse treatments are actually uh, used off shears and so they get tied into end shearing. So in terms of controlling lice, probably insecticide treatment timing is not ideal unless you're getting total eradication. Shearing and dagging, well nothing particularly surprising here. So shearing lambs occurring around the summer, shearing ewes a little bit earlier. Dagging lambs occurs over a long stretch of time and that's largely to, to actually try and, well, for various reasons, but flies have been an important one. And dagging ewes, somewhat bimodal, interestingly, um, with a break for Christmas by the looks of things. But presumably that's pre-shearing, and then once again dagging when they've actually got more wool on them. Anthelmetic treatments, because worm control was an important thing for actually one of the things, not only for worms, but for actually controlling fly strike. And you can see it's stretched out as you'd expect for lambs. And interesting, the number was 4.8, uh, which is consistent with what we've seen in, in earlier studies. The number of ewe treatments was 0.7. Uh, this one here will be a pre-lamb treatment, and that's topping out at 20%. And this one will be a pre-tup treatment, topping out about 12%. So relatively low, which is nice to see. It'd be nicer if, if those treatments of ewes were lower, but that's another argument. <coughs> those struck, what proportion struck around the breach? I expected this to be much higher. Um, I expected that these figures here would be the dominant numbers, but they're not implying for whatever reason that body strike somewhere away from the breach is actually much more common now than it was. Uh, if you actually have a look at Heath and Bishop's data from 95, you can see that breach strike was by far and away the predominant place that animals got struck. That's not what was reported in our survey. Do you aim to control for lice when you treat sheep to prevent fly strike? This is a no, yes, sometimes no response. If you look at the no's, it's probably the best way because take the others as yes or sometimes. And you can see it's reasonably consistent that about two thirds, something like that, um, a little bit higher in the um, bottom of the South Island where lice are considered more important, uh, are not trying to do that. Lambs treated at fly strike at docking. I thought this would be higher, actually. Uh, so yes, for the North Island, two thirds. Top of the South, it drops dramatically. Bottom of the South, very f relatively fewer are actually treating those lambs at docking. Probably reflecting the fact that this, the fly strike season is starting later down there. If you go back to the 70s, those figures would have been close to zero, I would suspect, because there was no easy way to do it unless you actually dunked the things actually in some container and everyone got covered in insecticide, if you recall back to those days. Do you give lice a, a treatment post-shearing? Um, yes. But no is actually, pro for, for lambs, no is higher. For ewes, it's about 50-50. So that's the lice treatment occurring at the time of shearing and that will explain the actual timing. But if you're trying to actually, unless, unless you eradicate lice, then you have a problem. <coughs> Two or three? Okay. So the, the products we're using, uh, these are the range of products and what we can see is dicyclinol in terms of backline applications is, is dominant or one of the cyromazine products. It's quite common on lambs, um, less so on ewes. 
that's click or clicks in. And then triflumeron, diflu, benzeron, BPUs. We know we've got some resistance in sericata to those and their use is declining a little. And spinosads, well, they're a bit hard to use actually in a backline application. If you go to automatic jetting, then cyromazine actually uh, dominates the picture. And there's various formulations of cyromazine out in the marketplace. Organophosphates largely disappeared. Uh, they would have dominated not that many years ago, but they're, uh, they're now starting to disappear. If we look at some of these products, I just want to say a couple of words about withholding periods. And these are just a, a selection of products uh, with different actives. So romazine, dicyclinol, triflumeron, diflubenzeron, spinosads, protein, well that's an OP, or a synthetic pyrethroid. And you see the meat withholding periods vary from very low numbers to actually relatively high numbers for dicyclinol, in fact. The wool, meat, the wool withholding periods are remarkably set there at 60 days, and that goes back to the voluntary uh, period that we had 20 years ago, uh, <coughs> where coarse wool was 60 days, mid-micron was 100 days, and fine wool was 150 days. And somewhere over the course of 20 years, those last two disappeared. And the only one you see on labels now is is the 60-day period, and they're all the same. Now, to think that they're all going to really be the same, they're not. So it's a voluntary type number, and apart from the spinosads, um, they've all adopted it. And that's probably a bit of... And just my last slide. <clears throat> this is the opinion of, of, of sources of advice, and we have a range of sources and this is lumping useful and get out of the way, I'm getting an echo there. Useful and very useful together. And you can see we range from 10% down to veterinarians up here at 71%. As I tell my veterinary colleagues, even at 71%, that still means 30% of farmers don't think you know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, <coughs> so there's probably room for some um, extension type activity to actually try and improve those figures up, one would think. Yep. My understanding of that is from when the sheep get fly strike in their feet and foot rot, and when they sit down, you know, their feet kind of like underneath their, and then the fly strike gets in underneath and then causes a. Oh, okay. Strike. I hadn't actually heard that connection with fly strike, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, that that's what damages the healthy. Yeah. That's my they have various sort of jargon terms, white spot, spot and other stuff. or some other issues in there. Yeah. Someone else raised their hand? Yep. Can you tell us anything about the smell of sheep being an attractor for flies? I think Australia does a bit of work on that sort of thing. It, flies respond to olfactory cues very strongly. And so there's been quite a bit of work on olfactory cues because people try to actually develop bait bins to drag the flies into the bait bin and, and, and once they're in the bin they're gone. Um, with, with mixed success uh, the actual smell of sheep per se, I'm unaware that that's the one, but the smell of dermatitis, uh, some protein type cues, the dermatitis you get around dags, those sort of things, flies will actually come from a long distance upwind to actually find the source. And, but you'll see a mob of sheep and the one that's struck, that, that's got 20 flies on it and the one standing next to it's got none. So it's not the sheep per se, it's the, it's the actual, those risk factors. And, and we know dermatophilus, which is that sort of funny bacteria that causes rain scald and get, you get the scabby bit caught up in the wool. Uh, and pseudomonas, you get the hot spots, which we can't see, but they're there, they're little low levels sort of derma, w with wet weather, with warm, humid weather. In fact, we do see it because sometimes you get those pseudomonas that actually fluoresce. You know, when the sheep occasionally fluoresce on you, they'll go purple, sometimes they go yellow. That's pseudomonas. You said um, one of the fly charts about the occurrence of fly across the country yep. being quite high. You, you're quite surprised that at this day and age with the things we have to deal with it. Um, do you have any comments on maybe why you think that's the case, even though we have all these various activities? I. 
If, 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 if you, I'm, I'm a parasitology type person these days. Uh, if I compare flies with worms, at least with worms I can drench them. It's a reasonably straightforward process. And I, if I have a program, I can keep that. But flies, even with automatic jetting races, um, it's, they're a real chore to actually sort of get on top of. I mean, we have better insecticides at the moment than we certainly had. Well, actually, yeah, let's say we've got better insecticides. Um, I think it's just the difficulty of actually getting those insecticides on. Uh, the labels don't help. I don't like labels that say up to 12 weeks protection because up to 12 weeks protection actually means nothing, but everyone reads it as 12 weeks protection. Uh, but that's not what they're saying. They're being very coy. Up to 12 could be one um, or none. And they talk about fly pressure. Well, how do you measure fly pressure? Um, so we'll try and do a little bit of that with the modelling if we can get that far down the track. But um, yeah, fly strikes have been a bit of an underdone topic. Farmers hate it. I mean, I've got a few sheep. I hate it. Um, don't, don't you think genetically is the way to approach it, really, like both fly and lice, because both of them are, are going to um, beat the um, chemicals at some stage, as you already know yeah. a lot of the chemicals aren't working, so the better approach is genetically. Sure. Well, genetically, so the Australians have put a big effort into both, actually. Um, but it, if we think about lice for a moment, we know there's some genetics involved in cockle, which is that hypersensitivity reaction. I didn't mention cockle, but it's a hypersensitive reaction that particularly young sheep have to lice. And, and you can get it in a line of lambs and not another line of lambs. So there is a genetic component in there. We know that ill-thrifty sheep have more lice than not ill-thrifty sheep. So sheep have got a clear ability to control louse numbers. Uh, but we don't actually understand the mechanism behind that. So genetics to actually sort of try and get a, a louse-free sheep haven't gone very far. For the fly one, they've actually not been able to breed the, well, apart from the wrinkly merino and get rid of the wrinkles, the Australians have actually selected sheep that don't get dermatophilus and don't get pseudomonas. That's how they've gone about it. And that, but they've stopped. I'm sorry, we're going to have to come to this. Well, but the other point to come out of this is when you do get surveys to report down on the farm, it's a huge amount of value for 